Volume 2, Chapter 2 Topics The Conspirators' Operations in Louisiana William Pitt Kellogg Visiting Statesmen in New Orleans The Composition and Operations of the Louisiana Returning Board Garfield Sherman Anderson Jewett Eliza Pinkston Fraudulent Registration The Reward of the Conspirators the methods by which Hayes electors were secured from Louisiana were, if possible, more shameless and indefensible than those employed for the like purpose in Florida. William Pitt Kellogg, then governor of Louisiana by virtue of an illegal order of Judge Durrell of the United States District Court, enforced by federal troops under orders from President Grant, enjoys the credit of having concocted the measures by which the people of that state were deprived of their choice of presidential electors. His objective point was a seat in the United States Senate for himself. He had already managed to subject all the elective machinery of the state to his personal control. He had the appointment of the supervisors and assistant supervisors of registration for every parish and ward in the state, he dictated the appointments of all the commissioners of election, the state register of voters and his clerks. Events subsequently disclosed a deliberate purpose on the part of Kellogg and his Republican Confederates to invalidate the election in seven parishes where they found they could not control the Negro vote, and by fictitious registration of names to make up whatever number of votes might be needed to secure a majority. To understand how this was to be accomplished it is necessary to notice some of the peculiarities of the Louisiana election laws. The returning board in Louisiana had no power to reject the vote of any precinct unless the certificate from such precinct came to them accompanied by a sworn protest signed by the supervisors that intimidation had been practiced. The commissioners of elections in each parish were required by law to make out their returns on the day of the election, and if anything happened to affect the purity and freedom of the election, they were to make a statement thereof under oath and have three citizens vouch for its truth and forward this statement with their returns, the tally sheets, registration lists, all made out in duplicate, one to the supervisor and one to the clerk of the parish court. These returns from the commissioners the supervisors were required by law to consolidate in duplicate, have them certified as correct by the clerk of the district court, according to the returns in his office, to deposit one copy of the consolidate statement with the said clerk and forward the other mail enclosed in an envelope of strong paper or cloth securely, to the returning board, with all the returns made by the commissioners, including their statement, if any, in regard to occurrences, affecting the purity and freedom of the voting. They had no authority to reject the returns from any poll or to refuse to compile them in their consolidated statements. When these consolidated returns reached the retuning board, its duty was first to compile the vote from those polls where there was presented no evidence that there had not been fair, free, and peaceable registration and election. That done, they were to take up the cases where the commissioners had reported that there had not been a fair, free, and peaceable registration and election. The law required this returning board to meet in New Orleans, within ten days after the closing of the election, to canvass and compile the statements of the votes made by the commissioners of election, and to continue in session till such returns have been compiled. The law also required that this board should consist of five persons to be elected by the Senate from all political parties. The Senate pretended to have complied with this law by appointing four Republicans and one Democrat. The Democrat that was appointed resigned. The law provided that in case of any vacancy by death, registration, or otherwise, by either of the board, then the vacancy shall be filled by the residue of the returning officers. It was very certain that the presence of a Democrat to witness the work they had in hand would prove most inconvenient, and therefore they refused to fill the vacancy. The scheme upon which Kellogg finally settled for invalidating the election was by alleging intimidation of voters, and upon that pretext throwing out enough Democratic votes to give the electoral vote of the state to Hayes. During the two weeks succeeding the election, visiting statesmen of both the great political parties had flocked to New Orleans. Several of the more conspicuous representatives of the Democratic Party there lost no time in addressing a note to Stanley Matthews, James A. Garfield, John A. Logan, William D. Kelly, John A. Casson, William M. Everts, E. W. Stoughton, and John A. Dix, each and all whom claimed to represent either the president in S.E. 
in being, actually existing, or the president in posse, in potential but not in actuality. In this note they stated that having understood that the gentlemen that they addressed were there at the request of President Grant, to see that the board of canvassers make a fair count of the votes actually cast, they invited a conference in order that such influence as they possessed might be exerted in behalf of such a canvas of the votes actually cast as by its fairness and impartiality shall command the respect and acquiescence of the American people of all parties. This invitation was declined by the Republican visiting statesmen on the ground that they were indisposed to reduce the function of the returning board to the mere clerical duty of counting the votes actually cast, irrespective of the question whether they were fraudulently and violently cast or otherwise vitiated. They further stated that, it is, in our judgment, vital to the preservation of constitutional liberty that the habit of obedience to the forms of law should be sedulously, persevering and constant in effort or application, inculcated, to teach others, by frequent instruction or repetition, indoctrinate, and cultivated, and that the resort to extra-constitutional mode of redress, to set right, remedy or rectify, for even actual grievances should be avoided and condemned as revolutionary, disorganizing, and tending to disorder and anarchy. Such a plea in avoidance might be successfully demurred to in any court of justice of competent jurisdiction. How the habit of obedience to the forms of law was to be compromised by the proposed conference, even though at the worst it failed to secure concert of action, is not quite clear. Be that, however, as it may, if obedience to the forms of law was the motive of their long journey to New Orleans and their protracted detention there, it proved a singular waste of energy, for every one of the provisions of the election laws we have cited was systematically and repeatedly violated, not only with the knowledge of these political purists, with the undisguised cooperation of most of them. We shall presently see that these traveling statesmen took a very different view of their duty when canvassing the votes of the states in the Electoral Commission. The election was entirely peaceable throughout the state. In the volumes of testimony subsequently taken by Congress there was not a particle of evidence that on the day of election there was any riot, tumult, or intimidation at a single polling place in the state. The election officers were all Republicans, and in accordance with the program of the Fifth Avenue conspirators they had been all given to understand that their political future depended entirely upon their faithful execution of their party behests. There were fifty-six parishes, exclusive of New Orleans, in the entire state, and nearly 1,000 polling places. There were 74 supervisors and assistant supervisors or registration, and three commissioners of election for each poll, all selected by the Republican managers, practically by Governor Kellogg. Footnote. The nature of these assurances may be gathered from the following circular issued by the Secretary of the Republican State Committee, Headquarters Republican Party of Louisiana, Rooms Joint Committee of Canvassing and Registration, Mechanics Institute, September 25, 1876 Supervisor of Registration, Parish or Assumption, L.A. Dear SIR, it is well known to this committee that, from examination of the census of 1875, the Republican vote in your parish is 2,200, and the Republican majority is 900. You are expected to register and vote the full strength of the Republican Party in your parish. Your recognition by the next state administration will depend upon your doing your full duty on the premises and you will not be held to have done your full duty unless the Republican registration in your parish reaches 2,200 and the Republican vote is at least 2,100. All local candidates and committees are directed to aid you to the utmost in obtaining the result, and every facility is and will be afforded you, but you must obtain the results called for herein without fail. Once obtained, your recognition will be ample and generous. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, D. J. M. A. Jewett, Secretary. End footnote. And yet when the returns came to the supervisors, were consolidated, and made ready for transmission to the returning board, only two supervisors had made any protests affecting the fairness of the registration or the peaceable and honest character of the election. In but one instance was intimidation alleged. The exception was in the 11th Ward of New Orleans, where two Custom House dependents refused to sign the returns, alleging intimidation. This was for disfranchising 412 respectable citizens living in the best portion of the residence quarter of the city. 
The poll was surrounded all day by deputy marshals and metropolitan police, everyone a Republican, and the United States supervisor, also a Republican, was present in the room where the votes were received. Of the two instances in which the returns of the supervisors stated objections to the votes of their parishes in conformity with the law, one affected only the votes for justices of the peace and constables, and the other was a case where the supervisor declined to incorporate the votes of two polls where he had established but one, and the commissioners without authority had established two. For one entire week after the election the Republican managers in New Orleans were confident that their plans had succeeded and that they had carried the state. They so assured their friends at Washington. But to make assurance double sure, they instructed their supervisors of registration to send their returns to New Orleans by mail. The law required them to bring their returns in person. As they came in, the supervisors deposited them at the custom house instead of delivering, as the law required, to the returning officers. Only 17 supervisors of registration sent their packages, as the law required, by mail and the registered packages containing these returns, instead of being delivered to the returning officers as the law required, were stopped at the post office, and retained there or handed over to the Republican managers. Had there been intimidation, of course it could only been expected from the Democrats, but what had the Democrats to gain by intimidation? They knew that the returning board had been established expressly to annual votes so secured and provide for votes so prevented. They knew, too, that the returning board in 1876 consisted of the same white members as in 1874, when in the parish of Rapids, where Wells, the president of the board resided the whole vote of the parish was thrown out and four Republican members of the legislature seated, upon a secret affidavit of Wells as to occurrences in that parish on the day of the election, when he was not there. The members so seated had not claimed to have been elected, and subsequently, upon the recommendation of the Congressional Committee, were unseated, and the conduct of Wells was officially denounced. The most and the best the Democrats could hope for was to offer the returning board no pretext whatever for setting aside the election because of intimidation, knowing as they did full well by experience that such pretext would be used against them without scruple or remorse. The returning board consisted of J. Madison Wells, Chairman, Thomas C. Anderson, Louis M. Kenner, and G. Cassinave, the last two colored. The returning board should have begun their labors by the express terms of the law on the 17th of November, and should have remained in session until the returns had been complied. The first open meeting for business was not held until the 20th. The interval seems to have been industriously utilized in ascertaining how many votes were to be thrown out to save the Hayes electors, and from what parishes the votes should be taken. Hence the direction to the supervisors of registration to bring their returns in person, instead of sending them, as the law required, by mail. The returns were opened and read by Anderson. What had been going on between their delivery and their opening may be inferred from the following incident which occurred at the session on the 25th. Footnote, nine years before, General Sheridan had preferred charges against Wells, the president of the board, while he was provisional governor of Louisiana, for dishonesty, and subsequently, 1877, Wells was indicted with his three colleagues by the grand jury of Louisiana for falsely and feloniously uttering and publishing as true a certain altered and forged and counterfeited public record, to wit, the consolidated statement of votes of the parish of Vernon, made by the supervisor of registration for said parish, whereby falsely and feloniously 178 votes were added to the number of votes actually cast for the Republican electors, and 395 votes were deducted from the number of votes actually cast for the Democratic electors by the voters of said parish. Wells took refuge in the swamps of New Orleans to escape arrest, the two Negroes were held to bail in $5,000 each, and Anderson was brought to trial, convicted, and sentenced to two years at hard labor in the penitentiary, and to pay the costs of prosecution. An appeal was taken by his counsel to the Supreme Court, where he was finally acquitted, not on the ground that he had not been guilty of all the forgeries and falsifications alleged, but on the technical ground that the consolidated statement made, such as was required to be made, by a supervisor of registration was not the election return contemplated by the Constitution, and therefore its alteration was not the forgery and falsification of a legal record. End footnote. 
It had been remarked by the Democrats that very few of the returns came by mail, and it was also a subject of complaint that the returns from many parishes had not yet been received. The returns from De Soto, however, had come by mail. Anderson in submitting them to the returning board was quite emphatic in stating this fact. He read, Consolidated Statement of Votes of the Parish of De Soto, and, after a pause, adding, with any quantity of affidavits attached. It happened that Mr. Burke and Mr. Gloyne, members of the Bar of Louisiana, and counsel for the Democrats, were in the room at this time, looking over some papers in parishes laid aside as contested. Mr. Burke asked, when was that package mailed? Anderson replied that it was mailed at Mansfield, Louisiana, and received on the 18th. What is the date of the first affidavit? asked Burke. Anderson with some hesitation, replied, November 25th, how does it happen? asked Mr. Gloyne that affidavits made on the 25th were in a package mailed on the 18th. After considerable confusion and hesitation, Abel, the secretary to the returning board, bethought him to suggest that there were two packages, one received on the 18th and the other that day, that the first contained the consolidated statement and the other the affidavits. Visiting statesman Stoughton came to Abel's rescue. Stoughton, what return is this received today? Abel, the return before the board now. I also received a small package on the 18th, which I presume was a consolidated statement. Stoughton, was the evidence in the package you received today? Abel, yes, sir. Stoughton, oh that settles it, merely a clerical error. It did settle it, for it showed conclusively that the returns had been tampered with, that the package Anderson had opened, and which had been receipted for on the 18th, was one from which he took the consolidated statement, with any quantity of affidavits attached. The evening before this exposure occurred there had been a meeting of certain persons especially interested in the vote of De Soto and two or three other parishes. Among them were George L. Smith, the candidate for Congress from the De Soto district, the supervisors of De Soto, Bossier, and Webster parishes, and D. D. Smith, the cashier of the post office, and D. J. M. A. Jewett, secretary of the Republican Committee, who had made himself conspicuous by recommending the governor to appoint no supervisors of registration in New Orleans, and thus threw out the entire vote on the principal city of the state. At this gathering, the cashier, Smith, unlocked the post office vault and took out the returns from De Soto, Bossier, Caddo, and Webster. Those from Bossier, Caddo, and Webster had been brought by the supervisors or the parishes respectively, or by someone selected by them for that purpose, and deposited at the post office for safekeeping until they were fixed, for the uses of the returning board. The returns from De Soto, though they had come by mail, instead of going to the returning board as they should have done, were also in the post office vault and under the absolute control of the men most immediately interested in tampering with the vote of that parish. The purpose of this gathering is fully set forth in the following statement made by DJMA. Jewett, one of the witnesses to its proceedings, C. L. Ferguson, supervisor, mailed his returns per registered package to New Orleans from Mansfield, November 14, he reached New Orleans in person about the 23rd, on the 24th I received from George L. Smith, in person, or from some person in his interest. A notice that my presence in the private office of the post office would be desirable about 9 or 10 p.m. that night. On my arrival I found there George L. Smith candidate for Congress, 4th District, D.D. Smith, Cashier Post Office, C.L. Ferguson, Supervisor de Soto Parish, T.H. Hutton, Supervisor Bossier Parish, John S. Morrow, Supervisor, Fred E. Heath, candidate for House of Representatives, and Samuel Gardner, citizen of Webster Parish, with one or two others, I think, whom I do not now remember. I had detailed Mr. McArdle to attend, and he was there, but on account of objections on the part of George L. Smith he was sent away. The fact whether protest had been made or not, etc., having been considered, D. D. Smith unlocked the post office vault and produced there from the returns of De Soto, Bossier, Caddo, and Webster. Caddo, it was stated, he had brought down himself. Bossier and Webster he had, as I understood. 
On the DeSoto package I noticed the postmark of Mansfield and that it bore evidence of registration. It was however, already open. It was unrolled and examined by Smith and myself. It was not possible to create a Republican majority except by throwing out polls, 1, 3, 5, 7 and 8. These were selected for protest, and Ferguson was asked for facts. I draft a protest based on such facts as he had knowledge of, either personally or from information received, or as was suggested by George L. Smith, or by the well-known conditions of the parish. This Ferguson copied, and was directed to take the same before F. A. Wolfley for administration of the oath. It was suggested to me, that of course it was not possible to attach this protest and various affidavits in hand affecting the same parish, taken before Commissioner Levisy, in Shreveport, to the consolidated state of votes, this having come forward by mail, and there being a disagreement of dates, but they should be handed or sent in under section 43, as per my circular letter of instructions. Notwithstanding, the unbounded stupidity of somebody rolled these up in the original package, which, restored apparently to its original condition, went forward by carrier to the board, November 25th. Such was visiting statesman Stoughton's notion of a clerical error which deprived Tilden of his majorities at five different polls in a single parish. The returns from ten other parishes were doctored at the same time and in like manner. The returns from Bossier, say Jewett, were handed by Captain Hutton, the supervisor, George L. Smith, the aforesaid candidate for Congress, for safe keeping, upon his, Hutton's, arrival in the city, and were by Smith placed in the vault of the post office. T. H. Hutton. Had, on November 13, the day that he started from Bellevue for New Orleans, sworn his consolidated statement of votes, popularly known as the returns, before George B. Abercrombie, clerk of the court, and had deposited with said clerk a copy, as required by law, at the date named, and when the returns were examined by me in the post office. This document bore in the space for remarks a protest of the Atkins landing box, number one and no other. In my presence, in the private office of the post office, the supervisor interpolated in the same space under the protest noted above, and above the jurat, a second protest, affecting the red land box, no. 3. There is no question in my mind but that the protest and exclusion of this box was an afterthought which first took shape at this time, November 24. F. M. Grant who brought the returns from Morehouse Parish about a week before the 25th of November, to which there was no protest attached, declined, says Jewett, the solicitations of Blanchard to make one. This being without effect, the governor took him apart, into an adjoining room, and they conferred together some time. The next day he was again interviewed by Kellogg at the Custom House, and was, as I was informed, taken to see the visiting statesman. Blanchard informed me that Grant was bulldozed by these and other partied for several days before he made the protest which he made November 18. At this time I purposely avoided even seeing the visiting statesmen except as I met them casually at Kellogg's, and it was arranged between myself and Mr. Blanchard that he should do everything which would require the slightest connection with them. This was done because it was not proposed that Mr. Blanchard should testify before either Committee of Congress when they came, as was expected, and I desired to be, myself, incapable of answering any inconvenient questions which might be propounded to me touching these gentlemen and their connection without affairs. Grady, the supervisor of Washita Parish, was unwilling to protest the election. I am informed by Blanchard, says Jewett, that Mr. Grady was bulldozed by Kellogg, Sherman, Garfield, and others for a week before he would sign the protest. He admitted to myself that he could not stand the pressure. I do not charge or believe that any fact stated by Grady was untrue or unknown to him, at least by common report. The evidence was simply obtained in a manner which deprived it of any legal value. Clover, the supervisor of East Baton Rouge, refused to compile the statements of votes cast at six different polls, through a willful disregard or ignorance of his duty. He was, sustained in his refusal, says Jewett, by Kellogg, Campbell, and others, to whose advice he would have yielded. Mr. Clover undoubtedly did this with the promise or expectation of reward. It may be said, Jewett continues, that I ought to have corrected him. 
This it would have been useless for me to do against the influence of those named, and, while Mr. Blanchard and myself were practically in control of the state registrar's office, and while Govern Hahn would have undoubtedly signed an order, drawn by either of us, to Mr. Clover, the law expressly accepted supervisors from obedience to the rulings or orders of the state registrar of voters, who was at the same time deemed their administrative chief. Similar refusals of the supervisors of Orleans and Lafouche were attended with similar results. How another, clerical error, in East Feliciana was corrected is thus stated by Jewett, James E. Anderson, supervisor, refused, upon his arrival in New Orleans, to make any protest, alleging as a reason his fear of being murdered if he did so. This, in his case, I did not believe, having been convinced by his then secret conduct that he was a corrupt scoundrel, who would protest or not, betray one party or the other, he was unquestionably in the employ of both, as he might conceive to be for his interest. As Governor Kellogg was responsible for his being in his parish to go through the farce of an election, I abandoned to Governor Kellogg the task of getting him to testify to notorious facts unquestionably within his knowledge, and washed my hands of him and of his affairs. I was present on two occasions at Kellogg's house, when Anderson and the governor were in conference respecting his testimony. On the 10th of November, immediately after his arrival, Anderson had signed a protest drawn by Hugh J. Campbell, which the following day he distinctly repudiated, and which he stated to be at least in part untrue. This protest was not finally accepted by him again until, as I was informed, Anderson had been promised the position of deputy naval officer, or something that should be a full equivalent. Anderson himself informed me while under the influence of liquor, about November 20, that he had got what he was after, by which remark and its context I understood that he had received pledges of reward for his testimony. I have also been informed that Messrs. Sherman and Garfield assisted in bringing Mr. Anderson to listen to reason. Jewett says, in conclusion, that protests and evidence, such as it was, which had been received and filed up to November 27, excluded votes for Packard 1,620 and for Nichols 9,700 leaving Mr. Packard elected by a clear majority, with a Republican majority in the Senate and House, and also elected three Hayes and five Tilden electors. Jewett adds that, in pursuance of a conspiracy to which he alleges that J. M. Wells, Thomas C. Anderson, John Sherman, and J. A. Garfield, and others, were parties, polls were excluded in the parishes of Caldwell, Natchitoches, Richland, Catahoula, Iberia, Livingston, and Tangipaho, with the result, and for the purpose, of the returning as elected five Hayes electors who were otherwise defeated, that the consideration of this conspiracy was the absolute control of the federal patronage within the state of Louisiana by the said Wells and Anderson, that the evidence used to effect the object of the conspiracy was manufactured without regard to actual facts and with the knowledge of the several conspirators and that the consideration to be given to said Wells and Anderson had been delivered up to date. But the returning board did not rely entirely upon the flexible consciences of supervisors. On the 28th of November Eliza Pinkston, a disreputable negress, notorious in three states for mendacity and beastliness, was born into the presence of the board and of the distinguished gentlemen of national reputation who were there helping to cultivate and inculcate the sanctities of the law. She swore that her husband had been taken from his house in the night, shot seven times, run through and through with knives, and mutilated in various ways her child's throat cut while in her arms, that she was twice shot and her person violated more times than she could remember and that all these outrages were committed by young white men of the neighborhood, many whom she professed to know and identify, one of them a well-known and highly respected physician. She also admitted that this medical monster came the day following all these outrages, when sent for, and dressed her wounds and ministered to her wants. There were scores of reputable gentlemen present who could have exposed this preposterous story, but they were not allowed to testify. The story would answer the concoctors of it better as it stood. Eliza Pinkston lived in Washita Parish, which gave a large Democratic majority. The board wanted a pretext for throwing it out and here they had it in a dramatic and thrilling piece of evidence to which the telegraph and the press would delight in giving the widest circulation. Absurd as the story was, 
it was deemed of sufficient importance for a committee of the House of Representatives to be sent down to Louisiana to investigate it. It was ascertained that her statement that her husband had been shot or mutilated was a fabrication, that the throat of her child had not been cut, and that there was no mark of violence on its body except a slight contusion on its head, that the men whom she charged with these outrages could not possibly have been in her neighborhood on the night in question. That she had made an affidavit in Monroe County for use before the returning board, in which she charged the crime of murder and other outrages on other persons, which was sent by the supervisor of Washita to the returning board November 23, but it was suppressed and withdrawn, and the another made in New Orleans, December 2, was substituted for it. It was also ascertained that the returning board had falsified its own record of the receipt of the returns from Washita. The secretary announced that they had been received November 24, but when opened, a letter was found addressed to Mr. Abel, saying, Enclosed please find an affidavit of Eliza Pinkston, which I received too late to file with my returns. Please see that it is brought in with other evidence filed with my returns. This letter was dated November 23. The character of this woman whose testimony was invoked to inculcate and cultivate obedience to law, as thus summarized by the Congressional Committee, the character of Eliza Pinkston, as developed before your subcommittee to the fullest extent, was such as to render her a fit instrument in the hands of designing men. She had been charged with the murder of the child of persons with whom she had but recently quarreled. The child died of poison. Eliza Pinkston, then known as Lizzie Finch, in Morehouse Parish, was arrested and acquitted only because the main witness to the crime was too young to understand the nature of the oath. The general impression was that she was guilty. When residing in Union Parish, she had shamefully beaten an old woman living with her, death ensuing in a few days after. She had abandoned one of her young children, leaving it to starve to death in a fence corner. Another she made way with shortly after its birth. She was a habitual abortionist. She was in perpetual quarrel. Her testimony had been so effectually impeached in the counts of Morehouse Parish that the Republican district attorney refused to call her as a witness. Everybody who knew her considered her a desperate character. Eyewitnesses proved that she lived with her husband on very bad terms. She was about to kill him at one time when she supposed him asleep. Upon another occasion she assaulted him with an axe, intending to kill him. He was in perpetual dread of harm, as witnesses testified. She was ugly, vulgar, indecent, and lewd beyond the worst. The rest of this description I am obliged to suppress as too indecent for these pages. According to this poor wretch's story, which Sherman, Garfield, Stoughton, and Matthews professed to believe, as number of malefactors had been guilty of a series of hideous crimes, not only against the laws of the state of Louisiana but against the laws of the United States. Why were not steps taken by either jurisdiction to arrest or punish any one of the alleged criminals? The arrest, trial, and hanging of a half-dozen of these murderers, if there were any would have been an object lesson far more efficacious for cultivating and inculcating obedience to law in Louisiana, than employing the testimony of such an outcast to compass the usurpation of the presidency. Towards the end of November the returning board thought they had rid themselves of enough democratic votes, by the methods of which we have given only a comparatively few examples, to ensure the election of Hayes, of Packard for governor, and a legislature that would be shameless enough to send Governor Kellogg to the United States Senate. But when they came to figure up the returns they found that they were still astray in their calculations and that guillotine must again be set to work that they must throw out the polls in nine other parishes, and the entire vote of East Feliciana and Grant Parish. They threw out, in addition, 69 polls from 22 other parishes, and refused to include the polls which the supervisors of East Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Lafouche, and the assistant supervisors of three wards in New Orleans had, without any warrant of law, wantonly refused to compile. In all, 13,214 Democratic electors were disfranchised and 2,415 Republican. The highest number of votes actually cast for a Democratic elector was 83,817, and for a Republican elector, 77,332. Five of the Republican electors ran behind the vote of their colleagues 1,141. 
The average majority for the Democratic electors was 7,116. The extent to which the people of Louisiana were defrauded by the returning board and their accomplices can be determined by another and very simple test, which no amount of perjury nor partisanship can assail. We have seen that the pretext for throwing out the returns from most of the disfranchised parishes was intimidation of the Negroes, by which they were prevented from registering and voting. The rejections from other causes were insignificant in number, and, in their influence upon the result, without importance. The names of the registered voters for the entire state in 1876, according to the statistics of the state's register's office, were 207,622. Of which there were of, colored, 115,268, white, 92,354, with a total of 23,914 colored voters in the majority. According to the census of 1870, the colored males of 21 years and upwards were 86,913, and white makes of like ages, 87,066. The colored class included Chinese and Indians, who had no votes. In 1880 the white males of 21 years and over numbered, 108,810, color makes of like age, 107,970 which showed that both classes had increased in about the same proportion, and their relative proportion could not have materially varied in 1876. If from colored makes the Chinese Indians, and foreign-born Negroes are deducted, manifestly the colored voters could not have exceeded the white. Professor Chale, who had made a special study of vital statistics in Louisiana, expressed the opinion that there was a small majority of white voters in the state. But, as we have seen, there were 22,914 more colored than white voters registered in the state in 1876. Five years after, and five years before, the white voters were in an undisputed majority, where did these 22,914 colored votes come from, and what had become of the army of Negroes who were alleged to have been afraid to register? These figures prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the names of over 20,000 names were registered that had only this nominal existence. Again, by the census of 1870 the white population of the parish of New Orleans was 140,923, of the Negro, 50,456 with whites over Negroes equaling 90,467. By the census of 1880 the white population was 158,369 and the Negro, 57,619, with white overcolored by 100,750. When the registration was completed in 1876, the 57,619 Negro population was found to yield 23,495 voters, and 140,923 whites, only 34,913 voters. Again the state census of 1875 gives an excess of 7,210 colored females over colored males in the parish of New Orleans, that is, in all, 36,013 females. Deducting these from the total of 57,619, there remained by 21,597 colored voters in the whole state in 1880. The number was doubtless somewhat less in 1876, and yet here were at least 2,891 more colored names registered that there could have been colored voters in the parish. But not content with fraudulently registering nearly if not quite 3,000 fictitious names, the Kellogg managers deliberately struck off from the registration lists the names of 7,738 white voters. And this was the way it was done, with the cooperation of Marshall, Pitkin, and the employees in the post office, some 30,000 circulars were sent out by the letter carriers, with instructions to return all not personally served. About 11,000 were so returned. The registration lists were then secretly taken to the custom house, where the supervisors were directed to strike off the names of all not personally served. Professor Chale, after a careful study of all available data, has expressed his conviction that an honest and complete registration of the voters of New Orleans would have given about 40,584 white and 13,500 Negro voters, instead of 22,495 and allowing for reasonable contingencies, such as absence, sickness, etc.
There ought not to have been of these more than 12,000 registered. Point one, but why accumulate further evidence of the nefarious processes by which this foul conspiracy against the rights of a sovereign state were consummated? It is enough to have shown that the Tilden and Hendricks electors were chosen in Louisiana and Florida by large popular majorities. That many thousands of Democratic voters were fraudulently disfranchised. That in no single instance had the commissioners of election shown or even alleged intimidation of voters. That there was not from a single polling place in the state a statement of the vote returned in the form required by law. That no one of the supervisors of registration had made objections to the registration of voters for a single voting place in the form required by law, nor had any of them reported intimidation or violence. That four supervisors had assumed judicial powers, which the law conferred only upon the returning officers, and by refusing to compile had thus rejected the commissioners' returns from twelve polling places, while three assistant supervisors for wards in New Orleans had illegally refused to consolidate returns from three polls. The distinguished statesmen who had assisted at this carnival of lawlessness not only found nothing in the proceedings to rebuke, but did not scruple to share in the loot, presumably in proportion to the importance of their respective services securing it. Senator Sherman was made Secretary of the Treasury, then quite the most important office in the President's gift. Stanley Matthews was nominated to a seat on the bench of the Supreme Court of the United States. The Senate declined to confirm him. He was renominated, in 1881, by President Garfield, who had been one of his coadjutors in New Orleans, and through the influence common to all new administrations, with all its federal patronage in reserve, the opposition to him in the Senate was overcome, and he was confirmed. James F. Garfield, who had his headquarters in the Custom House, where the affidavits were manufactured during the sessions of the returning board, was elected to the United States Senate by an arrangement with Stanley Matthews, and subsequently succeeded Hayes as the Republican candidate for the presidency. Footnote, those who may desire to probe this iniquity to its profoundest deep are referred to the investigations made by Committee on the 43rd, 44th and 45th Congresses, and to the more convenient compendium of A. M. Gibson, entitled, A Political Crime, to which I have been greatly indebted in making this synopsis of the evidence submitted to Congress. End footnote. William M. Everts, who in 1875 had denounced the illegal organization for the Louisiana House of Representatives with the aid of the military, and all the proceedings and acts of that body as well as of the returning board of 1874, went to New Orleans in 1876, and lent the weight of his personal and professional influence to assist, unconsciously, I fain believe, the men who were harvesting the crop of crime he had denounced the planting. He subsequently was the leading counsel for Hayes before the Electoral Commission. He received the office of Secretary of State. E. W. Stoughton. Who prepared the report to the President justifying the conduct and fulsomely eulogizing the character of the worthless creatures who constituted the returning board, was rewarded with the mission to Russia. It required the disfranchisement of a less number of the citizens of Louisiana to count in Packard as governor than to count Hayes electors, but then a governor has less patronage than a president to bestow, and it became necessary to abandon Packard to secure a sufficient number of Southern Democratic votes in the House of Representatives, to ensure the ratification of the decision of the Electoral Commission, of which I shall have to speak presently. Packard was reconciled to his fate by receiving the consulate at Liverpool, a place which, whether it was worth fifteen or thirty thousand dollars a year, depended mainly upon the character of the man who held it. Kellogg was rewarded for his services with a seat in the United States Senate, by what means may be inferred from the fact that of the members of the legislature who voted for him, eight senators, three officers of the Senate, thirty-two members of the House, and four officers of the House, making forty-seven in all, received lucrative appointments from the federal government, and, curiously enough, all of these patriots received their appointments from the department of which John Sherman was the chief. If the persons connected with the canvass, election, and negotiations in Louisiana, 69 were appointed to offices, and all but 16 of these were treasury appointments. Wells, the president of the retuning board, had one son appointed deputy surveyor at New Orleans, another son and son-in-law, to clerk ships in the same institution, 
on salaries ranging from $1,400 to $1,600 per annum. Anderson, Wells' white colleague on the returning board, was made deputy collector of the Port of New Orleans, his son. C. B. Anderson, was made a clerk in the Custom House, on a salary of $1,400, his son's father-in-law, auditor, on a salary of $2,500, and his son's brother-in-law, clerk on a salary of $1,200. Kenner, one of the Negroes on the returning board, was appointed deputy naval officer of the same port, one of his brothers was appointed to a $1,600 clerkship, and another brother, a laborer, at a salary of $600. Cassinave, the other colored member of the board, had a brother who was an undertaker appointed to a place in the custom house. His own expenses, incurred in defending himself and colleagues in New Orleans against criminal charges, were defrayed in part by President Hayes and Secretary Sherman. Woodward, clerk of the returning board, who assisted in falsifying the election returns, was appointed to a $1,400 clerkship, and was subsequently promoted to an assistant deputy surveyorship, at a salary of $1,600. Abel, the secretary of the retuning board, was appointed to a $1,600 clerkship in the Custom House. Judge G. B. Davis. A clerk of the returning board, and another man of equally easy virtue with any of his associates, also found an asylum in the Custom House. Green, a colored minute clerk of the board, in due time reached the same port, and afterwards was appointed an inspector at $3 per day. Charles Hill, another clerk of the returning board, and therefore possessed of perilous secrets, was appointed storekeeper, at a salary of $1,460. It is a fact not without significance that none of President Hayes' cabinet ministers, save his Secretary of the Treasury, availed themselves the privilege of rewarding any of the members of the returning board or of their zealous subordinates. Whether these dignitaries and emoluments were worth what they cost, whether the honors for which they were beholden to the frauds and forgeries of the four pied and speckled knaves who constituted the Louisiana Returning Board in 1876 are such as their offspring and friends will take pride in, and whether their names will be cherished by their countrymen for their active and passive parts in placing a man in the presidential chair who was not elected to the office by the people, are questions which may be safely left to the final arbitrament of history. How far, said the Honorable Clarkson N. Potter. In his admirable and temperate report, the most admirable because so temperate, the controlling visiting statesmen like Mr. Sherman really believed there was any justification for the rejection of Democratic votes by the returning board, men will never agree. We are apt to believe in the right of what we earnestly desire. Men who thought the welfare of the country depended upon the continuation in power of the Republican Party would naturally have been disposed to consider almost anything justified to retain it there. To us it seems impossible that the flagrant and atrocious conduct of the returning board was not realized above all by the men of most political experience, or that the most dangerous and outrageous political fraud of the age was not assisted and advised by those who next proceeded to take possession of its best fruits. Chairman of the Select Committee appointed by the House of Representatives, to inquire into the alleged fraudulent canvas and return of votes at the last presidential election in the states of Louisiana and Florida. End of chapter 2, volume 2